Good afternoon, everybody. For those who are just coming in, we're dead on three o'clock, so you're not really late arrivals, but please uh, come in with your coffee, find yourself a seat. There are still a few seats towards the front if you're not the shy type. Uh, welcome back to Think Tent for this, our first event of this year's Conservative Party conference. There are many, many more to follow that we're running jointly with the IEA with the Taxpayers Alliance. There is a list posted on the door. There are some cards with QR codes on it, which you can scan onto your phone to get the full list of events. But uh, welcome to this first one. My name's Mark Littlewood. I am the uh, Director General at the Institute of Economic Affairs, um, a, a free market think tank based in Westminster. Uh, contrary to media reports, I'm not the head of policy at Number 10 Downing Street, merely the Director General of the, uh, of the Institute of Economic Affairs. But we are addressing a question in this session, which the government has obviously turned its attention to. So let me uh, introduce uh, our panellists and then introduce the, the topic. Um, soon to be sitting on my far right will be Chris Philp MP, the new Chief Secretary to the Treasury. He's uh, had some urgent ministerial business, but uh, is going to arrive probably in about 25 minutes' time. He may have to leave a bit early. So when he does ar uh, arrive, and my apologies to his fellow panellists for this. I'll probably put the spotlight on him for his truncated uh, time here. Um, on my uh, immediate right is Andrew Allen, senior partner in LEK Consulting's London office, uh, has more than 28 years of consulting experience. He leads their transport practice in Europe, covers all modes of passenger and freight transport, also works in specific areas of business services and leads much of their work in dispute resolution and commercial claims. Uh, he's also the co-founder of the Taxpayers Alliance. So, uh, um, uh, on my uh, immediate left is uh, Gerard Lyons, senior fellow at Policy Exchange, one of the UK's leading economists, described by the Times as one of the most influential analysts of the global economy, more than 30 years of experience in the city, having held senior business and research roles with some of the world's largest international banks. And on my far left is Paul Faulkner. He's been the chief of staff for RCL Partners, the retained advisors to the Richardson family since 2021. Previously, he's been chief executive of the Greater Birmingham Chambers of Commerce, Aston Villa FC and Nottingham Forest FC. So he's definitely playing at home today, pretty much. <laughs> uh, welcome, Paul. As I say, Chris will be joining us uh, shortly. The topic that we wish to turn our attention to in this session, I'm going to ask each of our panellists to speak for five minutes, no more, is how to build a more pro-enterprise uh, pro economy. Uh, I guess uh, analysis from the likes of the IA and the Taxpayers Alliance over many years has been that taxes have generally got too high, I think to a 70-year high. We've got the highest taxes as a total proportion of GDP since the 1940s. Uh, government spending has obviously gone up somewhat in line with that. Well, it's worth saying that government debt has also gone up pretty dramatically too in recent years. Regulation has got tighter in general terms in most sectors, not looser. And economic growth uh, has been disappointing since the financial crash. I think we probably find much to commend in at least the questions the government's been asking itself since this new government came to office, and some of the answers, but not necessarily all of them. But in uh, under an hour, I'm very confident that our panel and you in the audience can crack this simple problem for us. <laughs> and to kick us off with his views, um, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. It's fantastic to be back at the, the think tent um, and to see it so busy as well. Um, so as a former chairman of the TPA, you can imagine I pretty much welcome the end to the relentless rise in taxes that we've seen for so long. I'm thinking I'm speaking to this room and hopefully amongst you know, people who, who think the same way and for whom it's obvious, this 70 year high in the tax pressure was very damaging. So to see the government not put through tax rises, I very much welcome, really I do. Um, there will be other changes and if you, some of you might remember the TPA's 2020 Tax Commission, that was written back in 2012, run by Alistair Heath, back when 2020 was the future time, and that suggested a, an important change to corporation tax from uh, taxing profits to taxing distributions, which would incentivize investment, which is a big part of building a more pro-enterprise economy. So back to that one. It was a big book, and it's still out there as, I think, a very good idea. Now, Mark mentioned, uh, I'm going to make two more points. Mark mentioned deregulation. So as far as I'm concerned, 
regulation is getting in the way of enterprise, much of it. We have to be very careful with the framework for that. Regulation about transparency often can be a good thing, and the criticism of London being the butler for the world, well, that's around transparency. So, yes, maybe we'll regulate transparency. But regulating prices, regulating commercial policies, regulating products overly heavily crushes innovation. And we may be getting to the point where everything's illegal except crime, and this does need to change. I, I studied physics as, as an undergrad, and I read recently a, a quite a woke quote which said, physics is the theology which makes machines work. I don't know if anyone's ever heard this. And I think, what garbage, right? Physics is the hunt for the truth about how things really, really work. And I would say a market view of things is also not theology. It's not ideology. It's just understanding the truth of how things really, really work. And when the left say markets are not working, I'm sure a lot of us would sort of cringe at that thought, oh, really? Well, yes, the market is working. It's just not giving the outcomes that the left happened to want. But a market of people pursuing at competitive advantage and pursuing profits, that's always going to be working. Right? So deregulation, I think, is an important point here. Starmer said in his speech, he's not afraid, did anyone see this? He's not afraid to use the power of government to help working people succeed. And I thought, yikes, right? That is pretty scary, right? Because the power of government, as we know, is huge, right? And whatever he might intend to do with that power, there's then that old-fashioned Thatcherite phrase, the unintended consequences. So much better, I think, would be to deregulate. Now, Mark mentioned I work in the city quite a lot. A few people in the room might recognize, how would a, a sophisticated investor see regulation? The private equity world, right? Don't we love them, right? So when they see regulations, they call it barriers to entry, and they call it regulatory protection. And they're not talking about, in that context, protecting the consumer. They're talking about protecting margins for established companies. And it makes people like that drool. Uh, now, I'm not criticizing PE, because they're just pursuing profits in a very rational way. But regulation creates those profits for <coughs> and those barriers to entry as an advantage to the incumbents, is how I would see it. One more minute, Mark? Yep. yep. You've, got, okay. you've got two more minutes. Well, then I'm, I'm going to be focused on last point. Uh, a lot of people talk about the productivity puzzle, right? We're all familiar with this phrase, and that's the, unlocking that is part of unlocking, I think, an enterprise economy. The global financial crisis is pinpointed as the date when things started to slow down. I think when you look at it for the few years in the run-up to that, the numbers were inflated, maybe even flattered, by the very strong financial services industry, right? I'm not saying that was false, but the rest of the economy has not really done very well at productivity since about 2000, a whole generation, right? And I was reading an LSE uh, report published in March 20, so before the furloughs and all of the recent changes in, in fiscal policy, and they did a survey economists, and a lot of them said their primary uh, the, the, the primary reason they thought for the slow productivity was lack of demand. And what they meant, and it said this in the paper, was austerity. Back in the old days when conservative governments tried to balance the books. Right? So I'm interested to see whether those same economists would now look at what this government's doing and say, hooray, some demand, that'll be good for productivity. Right? Somehow I doubt it because I think they were wrong then and that would be the wrong analysis. It's not about fiscal policy, it's about deregulation and getting out of the way. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Gerard, your five minutes start now, the floor is yours. Okay, well, good afternoon, thank you for inviting me here. How to build a more pro-enterprise economy. Let me highlight three things. First, you need to change the terms of the debate. Second, you need to take your target audiences with you. And then third, what you need to do. In terms of changing the terms of the debate, the country clearly needs a pro-growth economic strategy. This is where the debate should be and where it has not been for some time. Trust has moved, hopefully, the debate towards this place where pro-growth is now seen as critical. As Mark mentioned in his introductory comments, 2008. Before that, we grew the economy around 2.5%, so we doubled in size in real terms in less than 30 years. Now the economy grows at a rate where we double in size every 65 years or so. It makes a big difference. Low taxes are not, are not the main part of the policy. They are part of the story. Low taxes alone do not turn an economy around to deliver growth. 
the debate should focus very much on the pro-growth strategy. Second, to take your target audience with you. This is not just about communication. Successful economies need to have clarity, predictability and credibility in terms of their strategy and policy and there needs to be belief in that. There are probably four target audiences for this government. The general public, firms, investors and the markets. For the general public and the markets, the last week has probably been the sign of a thumbs down. Markets need to be convinced that changes in fiscal policy are necessary, not inflationary and are affordable. That was clear before the mini budget and if it wasn't clear then, it's certainly clear now. But for the general public, a very important message is that the social contract is a vital part of our post-war fabric and is seen, in my view, by the general public as critical to building a more enterprise economy. You cannot have a return to austerity and cut the top rate of tax at the same time. Um, third, what should be done? A um, solid foundation for policy has been outlined. Uh, it now needs to be executed. And I would say that there are three key parts of the foundation. One is low inflation, where we have monetary and financial stability. It's not just about low inflation. It's about a city that's competitive internationally and a city that, City of London this is, city that provides finance to firms across the country. We don't have that and we need to move towards that. The second foundation is fiscal discipline. What Trust was trying to do was to show that you could use fiscal policy to stabilise the economy in the short term, thus allowing monetary policy not to do that. Since 2008, we've had cheap money because every time there's been a shock, monetary policy has been relaxed. But while fiscal policy can help stabilise the economy in the short term, you do need to have fiscal discipline, reducing the ratio of debt to GDP over time and putting markers along the way. And the third foundation is the supply side agenda, which is a clunky term that no one seems to understand if they live in the real world. So maybe we need to talk about it in a different way. All the eyes. Investment is about more investment, not just in buildings, but in skills and training. We still have one in five people aged 16, 18 leaving school without sufficient numeracy and literacy skills. Uh, we need to have more investment across the board. Innovation. Britain has more universities in the top 100 than the rest of Western Europe put together. We need to have more inv innovation, not just of ideas out of universities, but generally across the economy. Infrastructure. Solvency too being changed is important, but also at the same time, you, there's a need to change the criteria in terms of what insurance and other funds can invest in. Building the infrastructure is key. And the final I is incentives. Um, reducing the burden of bureaucracy through lighter regulation and actually reducing the cost of the state that people have to pay through lower taxes is vital as part of the incentive structure. If you get all those I's right, you also then reduce inequality as well. So to conclude, how to build a more pro-enterprise economy? First, it's very much about changing the terms of the debate, so it's focused on pro-growth strategies. And as I say, low taxes are part of the story, but they are not the main part of the story. Second is about bringing your target audiences with you, and within that, the social contract is a vital part of the fabric. And third, I would actually say the foundations of the strategy are now being articulated and it's about executing them. Monetary and financial stability, proactive fiscal policy within a fiscal disciplines framework, and all the I's, investment, innovation, infrastructure, and incentives. Thank you. Gerard, thank you so much. Lyrics so beautiful that we hired a band in order to set it entirely to, to, to music. Um, uh, Thank you very much. And um, Paul, the floor is now yours for your thoughts. What well, would be your solution to building a more pro-enterprise economy, Paul? Yeah, thank you, Mark. And uh, you said this was very much a home game for me, being from Birmingham. But as a Villa man, I think uh, it reminds me of going and playing away at Birmingham City right now. But I, I do hope everyone who's visiting uh, our great city for a few days 
has a brilliant time here because Birmingham is a wonderful place. It's very much on the up, so do get out there and uh, and enjoy all that the city has to offer. That's despite some of the things we may have seen on Twitter in recent times. Um, I suppose you know from a business perspective, then then fundamentally you want a clear plan, which will incentivise people to go out there to take risks and to build and to grow a business and to continue to doing that. You want the government to set that framework and then get out of the way. I would say uh, you want that that plan to be executed on. I think delivery often gets overlooked and we really sort of believe that you know, actually seeing a plan through is uh, incredibly important. Um, you know, our own business, Richardson business, very much followed this path in the early 80s under you know, Mrs. Thatcher where you know, um, utilizing enterprise zones, we took a, an old steelworks and redeveloped it into one of Europe's leading uh, shopping centers, the Merry Hill sort of center. That created tens of thousands of jobs and helped to put hundreds of millions of pounds, if not even a billion pounds, back into the treasury coffers. And you know, it was because people were incentivized to go out there, put their neck on the block and take risks. And that's what great business is really all about. So, I mean, there definitely were some pockets in the announcements in the mini budget, which were really encouraging. And I think, um, as Jared was saying about getting the debate around a pro-growth strategy is really encouraging. Um, we really liked the, the talk of investment zones. I think free ports are a great initiative and we talked about seeing more. I think there was a little bit of um, chagrin here in the West Midlands that, that we didn't have a free port. So we're hopeful now that we can take advantage of the investment zones, the, the work around the annual investment allowance, etc., is also um, very, very welcome. But the challenge is going to be taking people uh, with them now and you know, the debate moves on very very quickly two other points uh, I wanted to make I think international trade is incredibly important and would like to see that as a part of the debate um, you know surely one of the the benefits of, of brexit is that ability to, to deregulate and set our own path on how we we trade with the world you know Britain's done that before it's what made us great back in in, in the day and so I think like really having a focus on driving international trade doing we do it well we've got to do it better uh, it's massively important I think you know, government estimates that, that jobs which are connected to exporting on average pay about 7% more than those which don't so um, trade should be a big focus particularly over in Asia Pacific as well where we're going to have 60% of the world's middle class living by 2030 and then finally um, I think just without sounding too trite, but a positive mindset. I think you can get sucked into these cycles of doom and gloom. There are some extraordinary challenges out there in the world right now, but, but my word, do we feel like you get stuck in these, um, these ever decreasing circles. And you know, actually, you know, Britain has a lot going for us. I think sometimes we overlook that. You know, you can say maybe you no know, rule of law, or the fact that the world really runs around GMT or, you know, um, our, our standing which is still so well regarded by by other countries around the world though know, people want to buy our goods and our services we, we're a little bit too inward looking sometimes but we can achieve great things with a positive mindset and i think in and amongst all of the intellectual debates we have to try to hold on to that and we've got to break this cycle of of negativity and change which doesn't help anybody and put you know, our, our best foot forward Paul, thank you. Uh, warm welcome to Chris, Chris Phil. I know you've only got 20 minutes or so uh, with us. The good news for you, Chris, is our other three panellists have solved the problem on how to build enterprise. So we will send you the recording of that with the full musical accompaniment. Um, but perhaps you could tell us how the government's been trying to do this. Your plans on how to build a pro-enterprise economy weren't necessarily received by the markets as well as you might have hoped uh, just over 10 days ago. But talk us through what your plan is for more enterprise in Britain. Brilliant, Mark. Well, brilliant, Mark. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Can we get this on? I'm just, we're just checking at the back. I'll use, I'll use this one. I'll, I'll use this one. Well, Mark, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for organising this extremely friendly uh, okay. welcome outside. You must have gone to a great deal of trouble to arrange for your friends to join us in this in this way. And um, look, I think there is uh, there is no topic more important than getting our national economic growth going, because so much else flows from that. If we want to build a society and an economy where wages are going up, where good jobs are being created, where businesses are growing and flourishing, and where 
a sustainable tax base is generated to pay for the public services of the future, then we need to have economic growth. And that's why the first thing the Prime Minister did, uh, and the Chancellor did, after coming uh, to office, was launching a growth plan, um, because that is our national mission, it's our objective as a government. Now, the growth plan uh, has quite a few important elements to it, but t tax most obviously, but it's got a lot more in it besides that, many of which got unfortunately drowned out, rather in the same way that I'm getting drowned out now, by uh, the media um, sort of noise and the market turbulence last week. But let me just start with taxation, because that was the area that was most widely commented on last week. Um, there is no question at all in our mind that low levels of competitive taxation are an essential prerequisite of economic growth. Look, that's even quietened down the people outside a little bit. Um, you know, so keeping corporation tax at 19% is essential to making sure businesses invest, and it's essential to making sure that companies choose to locate in the United Kingdom as opposed to anywhere else. They've got a, I used to be technology minister, tech businesses have a choice about where they locate, they don't have to locate in the UK, and getting them to come here rather than Singapore or New York or Geneva or anywhere else in the world, part of that is down to tax. And as we look around the world, Ireland, just next door, has a corporation tax rate of 12.5%. Singapore has a tax rate, corporation tax rate of 17%. And even Sweden, which you would think of as a high tax sort of social democrat economy, has a corporation, corporation tax rate of 20.6%. So there's no doubt in my mind that 19% is an essential component of our international competitiveness. And by the way, when we last cut this tax, when George Osborne cut this tax from 28% down to 19% between 2011 and 2017, so much extra investment was stimulated, so many companies were encouraged to come to this country, that the amount of cash raised, the pounds raised, actually went up from about 35 billion to 55 billion. So not only is it pro-competition, it can also lead to more money being raised as well. Now, when it comes to the top rate of income tax, which has been uh, commented on a great deal, once again, international competitiveness is crucial. Uh, for people earning £150,000 a year, in Germany, it's 42%. In the state of New York, 38%. And in California, 41%. It goes up in those states um, above those levels, but at 150000 it's around about the 40 mark. Even New Zealand, which has a left-of-centre prime minister, has a top tax rate of 39%. So again, if we're going to attract the best people to come to this country and pay tax here, then we need to be competitive. And once again, looking back at those Osborne Cameron years, when they cut the top rate from 50p to 45, it actually had, uh, it had no negative impact on the amount of money being raised at all. So this government um, is going to stick by its plans to make our tax rate competitive, because by doing that, we'll grow the economy, we'll encourage innovation, we'll encourage people to come here, and ultimately, we will raise more money to fund public services. But as I said, tax is only a small part of the growth plan. There, have, there are lots of other very important bits as well. And let's not forget those. The first piece I'd like to refer to is the energy intervention. I mean, that got completely forgotten in the turmoil of last week. But, you know, just a few weeks ago, businesses and families were terrified that their energy bills were going to be five, six, seven thousand pounds per year this winter and next winter. And by taking decisive action, we've stopped that from happening. They're going to be no higher than two and a half thousand pounds per year on average for families and also for businesses. And in doing that, it means the inflation rate is going to be 5% lower than it would otherwise be. That is a massive intervention that will protect every single family and every single business in this country. We're also going to turbocharge infrastructure investment. It's vital we do that. Uh, speed up road building, speed up railway building. It can take five to seven years to get a major road build in this country, which is just ridiculous. And we're going to turbocharge that. We're going to incentivize uh, investment. We're going to fix the annual investment allowance at a million pounds instead of moving it around. We're increasing the SEIS, the Seed Enterprise Investment Schemes limits, to encourage investment in early stage businesses. And um, we've said we're minded to maintain VCT and EIS tax relief beyond the cu pl currently planned sunset 
in 2025. We're going to be reducing business regulation. Jacob Rees-Mogg has a whole load of ideas to do that, uh, one of which is making sure that no business under 500 employees gets subject to business regulation, another critically important uh, move. Um, Jacob's going to lay out, lay out a whole load more ideas in that area. Uh, and when it comes to freelancers, people who are uh, operating innovatively, flexibly and dynamically in our economy, we are going to reverse the burdens imposed by the 2017 and 2021 IR35 moves. Um, those are just a few of, of the ideas we have. And I'm completely confident that doing those things will unleash the growth potential of our economy. It's going to increase our growth rate, I think, by at least a percentage point above what it would otherwise be, which will ensure our fellow citizens enjoy higher wage jobs, ensure businesses, big and small alike, can flourish. It'll ensure the United Kingdom is the best jurisdiction in the world to locate if you're a high potential individual or a high potential company. This will benefit the entire economy. It'll benefit every one of our fellow citizens. I'm confident this is the right agenda and this government is going to deliver it with absolute determination and absolute clarity of purpose. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm conscious, Chris, that we've only got you for about another 15 minutes or so before you need to go. So with apologies to the other panellists, I might direct a few more of the questions your way. And then I will come to the floor. I've just got one or two that I'd like to um, ask about. And now, Paul, this was something you mentioned, but I'm going to put it to uh, Chris first. Uh, enterprise zones or investment zones, as I think they're now being badged. What's the rationale that these will work to deliver overall growth rather than just relocate activity from one non enterprise zone in the IA to an enterprise zone. Paul was talking about, you know, could we you know, want this in the West Midlands? And I can understand why each region would want these benefits. But explain to me why it improves growth overall rather than just lead someone to relocate from a non-enterprise designated area to an enterprise designated area. Yeah, well, look, these enterprise zones will take will be right across the whole country. They're not just for some areas. We're talking already to 38 local authorities about them. And I've, I've spoken with the devolved administrations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland about establishing investment zones there as well. Uh, we think they are genuinely additive. We think they will stimulate investment and stimulate growth that would not otherwise happen. And I think one of the best examples of an investment zone from the past that has worked is, uh, is Canary Wharf, you know, which in the 1980s was a uh, sort of desolate post-apocalyptic post industrial wasteland. And thanks to the what effectively was a gigantic investment zone in the Canary Wharf area is now Europe's financial capital. And it's done that not at the expense of the City of London, but in addition to what is happening in the City of London. So there, I think, is a really good example of an investment zone being additive. The freedoms they confer uh, with agreement with the local authority, nothing is being imposed. Uh, the freedom around planning in these designated sites, uh, the tax alleviation around things like stamp duty, uh, business rates, capital allowance, all of those kind of things, we think will create new investment, new enterprises and new businesses that wouldn't otherwise exist. And I'm very excited about the work Simon Clark and his team are doing on those. But if it works, why not just have one enterprise zone and call it the United Kingdom? Or I guess England, you might leave it to the devolved assemblies whether they want to follow suit. It, it all sounds great. If it worked well, for Canary Wharf, let's have it everywhere. Well, I, I think the very ambitious plans we set out in the growth, growth agenda uh, a week or two ago obviously do, most of them apply, almost all of them in fact, apart from investment zones, do apply to the United Kingdom. So in that sense, we are making the whole country uh, an investment zone. But these are areas where we think there is a particular opportunity to go further. Obviously, if these are successful, uh, we can see what that means uh, for the rest of the country. But by the way, th there is no limit on these. Any local authority that wants to have investment zones in their geographic area can come and talk to Simon Clark. And if anyone here is a local councillor or works for a, a mayoral authority, uh, please go and talk to Simon Clark about the opportunities that these represent. Chris, I'm going to come back to you in a minute, but let me start, um, Paul, at your end of the panel. I'd like to ask all of our panellists, I'll finish with Chris, but I think I know his answer. How, how would you score the mini budget out of 10? Where a 10 is absolute perfection and naught is a so complete I'm going to set the mark here, yeah, am yeah, I then? Yeah, you're going to um, set the mark here, yeah. I'd give it a 7.5 for um, sort of ambitions in terms of, of delivery. Um, struggling to get above two or three okay and the communication uh, i should say that the communication but the content you'd yeah. say seven and a half yeah. right
Ger- Gerard, what would your number be for how good it was out of 10? Um, well, I was asked that question immediately after on the TV and the radio. I gave it 8 out of 10, but I said the two bits that were missing in terms of not getting it to 10 out of 10, unfortunately, would dominate the whole debate. I was critical of the decision to uh, cut the top rate of tax at that time. I thought it was a case of tax simplification. It should have waited till the full budget to be fully costed and should have been implemented alongside other tax simplification measures, such as raising uh, allowances to pull people out of fiscal drag, to get rid of the marginal tax rate when you go above 50 grand, and to get rid of, your, your marginal tax rate goes up a lot. If you have child benefit, it's withdrawn as you go above 50,000. And also if you go above 100 grand, if you're lucky enough, your marginal tax rate also goes up. What was good, basically in my personal view, the fiscal statement should have stuck to just three things. It should have stuck to what was said on the tin, so to speak, in the election campaign. Um, in the leadership in, campaign. In the leadership campaign, endorsing the energy price cap, reversing the planned increase in corporation tax and reversing the increase in national insurance. The markets were fully on board with that. Doing those three things together would have prevented a deep recession, would have prevented the public finances being blown fully out of the water. And the other measures, if you looked at the overall measures, apart from the energy cap, of the other fiscal measures, 82 pence in every pound borrowed was reversing the corporation tax increase and reversing the national insurance tax increase. The rest of it was quite small fry. Needn't have been done then, in my personal view. Should have waited until a fully costed budget. Can I just make a point about the corporation tax? Because lots of uh, the minister, I think, made a very important point on this. But another important point is that economists are often supportive of the national insurance tax being reversed, but are critical of the corporation tax being reversed. What they often fail to acknowledge is that when the corporation tax rate came down, at the same time the corporate tax base widened quite significantly. And the OPR did a report on that a couple of years ago. So much so that if we were to reverse the corporation tax increase, sorry, reverse the corporation tax or increased as Rishi Sunak had planned, you would be increasing the tax on a much wider tax base and you would have clobbered the business sector. Indeed, the uh, Centre for Policy Studies saying said that the combined effect of all of those planned previous changes would have moved Britain from 11th to 31st in the OECD in terms of business taxation. So not going ahead with the corporation tax, not going ahead with the national insurance and the energy levy were fantastic parts of the budget or the mini budget or fiscal statement, whatever you want to call it, as well as, as um, Paul was mentioned, the supply side measures. So I thought there was a lot of good stuff in it, but unfortunately, because of those bits that uh, were not in the market's eyes fully costed and could have waited that tended to overshadow things unfortunately and so what was your number out of 10 Joe? um i gave it eight out of ten that morning i probably would let's say seven and a half out of ten with paul but <laughs> eight, eight i thought it was a pretty it was a pretty good but uh, mini statement on the growth side the bits of it though that they shouldn't have gone ahead but you're with. You're knocking 0.5 off for the market reaction. Well, no, I, actually, the, the point is that look at the substance. There was a lot of good stuff there. Okay. It was a very good pro-growth agenda, but it failed the key test of failing to provide a reassurance to the markets that fiscal policy changes were necessary, were non-inflationary, and were affordable, and that was avoidable. But okay. we are where we are. Andrew, your score out of ten, and why? I'll be very brief. I was here two months ago for the games, uh, so I feel like I'm watching the synchronised diving again. Uh, So for technical delivery of tax changes, probably a seven. I think I agree with what Jared said about um, more consulting on the other smaller parts of it, which could have still been done within a month or two, but could have been warmed up better. In terms of synchronisation with the other divers, the OBR and the markets and so forth, probably a three. (laughs) Okay, well, I mean, Look, I would, I would score it highly because the substance of it, I think, was the right substance. So nine and a half for that. I think the Prime Minister acknowledged that some of the pitch rolling uh, could have been a bit better in her interview this morning. Uh, but what matters here is the substance. And what people will remember in months and years to come is what this plan delivers. And when this plan delivers higher growth, higher wages, more jobs 
and a strong economy, that is what people will remember and what people, I think, will uh, be pleased about. And the reaction that I thought was, that was the most telling last week uh, was the fact that the British Chambers of Commerce, uh, the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, and the Federation of Small Businesses all very, very strongly welcomed this growth plan. And their reaction, for me, is the most important one. Uh, the questions that some market participants have uh, around how this all adds up and what it means for our fiscal envelope uh, is going to be answered. It'll be answered, obviously, uh, by the Chancellor in the medium-term fiscal plan on November the 23rd. Um, so those answers, uh, which weren't given in the growth plan, will be given very shortly. And when the market sees them, uh, then I think it will be reassured by those plans. So can I just ask you that, Chris, that the, the Prime Minister said this morning that she didn't think, she didn't quite use the term rolling the pitch, but that there hadn't been enough preparatory work about the tax cuts. Is it your view that the markets were spooked not by the basic substance and thrust of the plans, but by uh, a present lack of clarity, which we're going to have to wait till November the 23rd for, I understand, on proof that the government has any fiscal discipline. Well, look, I'm, I don't want to speculate about the reasons for market movements. Uh, the government categorically does have fiscal discipline. First of all, we're starting this uh, with the second lowest debt over GDP ratio in the G7. Uh, secondly, the Chancellor has been very clear that we will set out plans that see that ratio falling over the medium term. And I've been very clear over the last two weeks as Chief Secretary that we are going to have iron fiscal discipline and we are going to stick to our spending limits. Uh, so I think we've been pretty clear about that, but the detail will come on November the 23rd and that will answer any remaining questions. Um, I'm going to ask the panel one further question, then I'll come to the audience. So catch my eye. I think we've got two microphones in the room and I'll, I'll try and get to a good number of you. Chris, perhaps I can start with you again. For all of the furore, market turmoil and political fallout about the mini-budget, I want to ask each of you whether, oddly enough, there might be a bit more of a consensus about lower tax than we thought. My understanding of it, I stand to be corrected, is that the Labour Party say they would reverse the 45p abolition, they bring that back, but have bought into the 19p reduction in the basic rate of income tax, and the abolition of national insurance. Is there actually now some wonderful cross-party agreement that the tax burden should fall? Well, that's a very interesting question. And, and of course, um, those measures that Mark just outlined, that Labour apparently now agree with, make up about 90% of the fiscal cost um, that was announced the other week. The additional rate tax ban, which they say they would reintroduce, is only a very, very small proportion, less than 1 20th, of the total fiscal firepower deployed. Everything else was very broadly based measures um, that benefit absolutely everybody, like the 19p income tax ban and national insurance cut. Uh, and by the way, when Labour uh, criticised this additional rate uh, move, the abolition of the additional rate, as if somehow it is a work of unmitigated um, sort of evil, they forget to mention that during almost the entirety of the Blair Brown government, for all of those 13 years, apart I think from the last month, uh, the top rate of tax was 40p. And I didn't hear any of them complaining about it um, then. Um, in terms of uh, market turmoil, look, I think uh, obviously the markets have settled down. Uh, I noticed that when the currency went down, the BBC reported it on their sort of front page, and it was a big splash. When it went back up again uh, to the level it was at previously, um, before the statement, the BBC were, uh, and others, other outlets were remarkably silent on the topic. Um, but, I'm, but I'm confident that once the full plans are set out in just a few weeks' time, um, any, any sort of market uh, questions will be categorically answered. Uh, I understand your mic is now on, Chris, so you can pass it. Uh, Andrew, do you think there is the beginnings of a new consensus on tax here? As I say, the Labour Party has not bought into the overall substance of the plan and certain elements of the tax, but they have bought into other elements of the tax cuts. Yeah, I think that's right, Mark. It's a very good point. So TPA polling for many years showed no matter where tax pressure was, there's a lot of people in the middle would say sort of keep it as it is. Right? And then there's the usual suspects who always say, tax anybody wealthier than me more, right? Because uh, they're, they're oppressors, and if they're richer than me, they must be taxed more. And there will be people calling for tax cuts. Wherever you are, you can find a consensus. A lot of people would say, don't change. Gerard, very briefly, some new consensus, at least on some taxes? Um, yeah, I think the important point about fiscal discipline is that if the package had just focused on the energy levy and reversing those two tax increases that were significant tax increases then it would have ticked all the boxes on fiscal discipline it was the other areas we've touched on but if I could on tax I don't think there is uh, the problem as you you 
there is a conformity. I think the challenge in the last week has been the general public has become, in my read of it, concerned about the rise in interest rates. And the challenge, of course, is regardless of who is in government, indeed whoever would have been in power, um, the backdrop is that we are moving away from cheap money, not just in, here in the UK but globally. Uh, the unfortunate aspect, to use the word unfortunate again, about the mini-state budget on that Friday was not only that it was not costed fully, but on the Wednesday evening the US Federal Reserve Board, their equivalent of our Bank of England, had raised rates 0.5%, had indicated quite clearly that interest rates would rise by another 1.25% by year end. On the Thursday the markets had fully discounted the Bank of England hiking by half a point, had hoped that the Bank of England would hike by the same as the Fed, mm -hmm. and also had hoped that the Bank of England would not go ahead with quantitative tightening, that is selling gilts. In the event the Bank of England only, in quotation marks, or the Bank of England raised rates at still a significant amount, 0.5%, but not the full amount the market mm -hmm. had wanted. But more importantly, in terms of this debate, which partially explains the Friday developments, they proceeded with a guilt issuance over the next year. So ba basically, the market is having to handle three types of guilt sales. One, the normal debt management office, the second, the Bank of England, yep. and third, what happened on the Friday. So I think in terms of tax, there is agreement, but I think it was the interest rate debate that has really impacted okay. people this last week, and that's where more context needs to be provided, in my personal Paul, opinion. do you think there's an emerging consensus on tax? I, I would agree with that. I think the one uh, thing that is a little concerning is some of the Labour rhetoric on windfall tax, which has continued. And yeah. I think that sort of works against, you know, the sort of enterprise and, and uh, sort of that may be one point of divergence that we may pick up on later, or certainly something that alarms, uh, alarms us somewhat. Uh, okay, I'm going to take uh, three questions from the floor. Lady at the back there, George in the middle, middle here, and then um, Fariz, I'll take the lady just behind George and two back. We'll take three questions, very strict rules here. You can give a question, you can even give a speech, but it mustn't be any more than one sentence in length, okay? And if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, if you're happy to, that would be great as well. Hi, um, my name's Nadine Batchelahan, I work at Yahoo News. I've just got a very quick question, which is, in principle, do you believe that cutting tax for the highest earners um, is a sacrifice worth making if you cut benefits for those on the lowest earners? Okay, thank you. Mike's not on. Hello? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, George Crozier, I work for the Chartered Institute of Taxation. Um, two things the last government were doing, they were, were reviewing capital allowances and they were exploring an online sales tax. Um, should we assume the review of capital allowances is still going on? Um, and should we assume the online sales tax, given the current government's agenda, is dead in the water? Interesting question. And if you could pass the microphone to the lady just behind you. Hello, uh, my name is Lynn Joyce and I'm just wondering how Wales and Scotland can fully benefit from the growth plan. Uh, in Wales, we have a first minister who has stopped all new road building. And in Scotland, you have different tax rates. So I'm not sure how we can fully benefit, apart from the, um, the industrial zones, if they want to take part. Thank you. Chris, can I perhaps start with your response to those questions? Just, just to remind you, yeah, the, if you're losing a good amount of money, uh, and I know numbers vary, there might even be Laffer curve arguments about that top rate of income tax. You mentioned that you know the cuts last time from 50 to 45 didn't obviously show government revenues declining, but uh, is the government seriously cutting the top rate of tax whilst also under consideration would be a real-time cut in benefits? Is that a trade-off you're willing to make? Um, uh, George asked whether capital allowances are under review and we should assume the online sales tax is for the birds. And while well, you are the UK government, what, what uh, benefit might there come to devolved areas, Wales, Scotland, and if I could add on, Northern Ireland as well? Yeah, well, just um, very briefly. I mean, first of all, I, I don't ca accept the characterisation of this uh, uh, growth plan as targeting tax cuts at the high earners because the, the abolition of the additional rate is only, as I said earlier, one twentieth of the total package by value, about 2 billion out of 44 billion. Most of those cuts, the national insurance cut, extending the 19p band, uh, or bring that forward sooner, uh, benefits absolutely everybody, um, regardless of earnings. The corporation tax uh, holding up 19% benefits businesses, big and small. Any business making profits of more than 50,000 pounds a year 
will benefit from that. And so I don't accept the characterization uh, of this growth plan as being disproportionately orientated towards um, higher earners. Um, on the online sales tax and capital allowances, I mean, that's a matter for a future budget. So um, I'm not going to I'm not going to speculate uh, about those um, just at the moment. And finally, in terms of uh, the devolved administrations, uh, many of these measures, uh, like corporation tax, are, of course, UK-wide. So all constituent parts of the United Kingdom will benefit from them. Um, and, uh, and investment zones, as I say, I'm working, I have already spoken to the uh, Deputy First Minister of Scotland, uh, the Economy Minister in Wales and the Economy Minister in Northern Ireland uh, to initiate a programme of work to make sure they do apply in the, the DAs. And I know Simon Clark, as DLUC Secretary, is going to be following that up um, with each of the, uh, each of the administrations. Uh, Gerard, I'll come to you next. What, what do you think about this, that, that you've already said that you wouldn't have cut the 45p rate? I just wonder if you think that's a matter of economics or a matter of political optics. Do you think there's a Laffer curve argument there about reducing the top rates? Well, no, in terms of the economics and the markets, the, to be clear, it was important not to um, surprise stroke spook the markets. Look, the OBR normally provides... Uh, marks the homework, shall we say, of whoever's in government. It should be clear, well, if you look at these figures, the margin of error on OBR projections is huge. Um, for instance, when Rishi Sunak had decided that the national insurance tax should be increased to gain 11 to 12 billion pounds, I think, as I read afterwards, it was Liz Truss who pointed out at the cabinet meeting, already the public finances were 70 billion better than the OBR had previously expected. When the economy does well, the revenues tend to outperform. When the economy does poorly, the revenues underperform. So um, the challenge about, as the minister said, the actual top rate coming down was small in economic terms. What it did do, though, was one, it fed the narrative that these numbers are not fully costed. It fed the misplaced narrative. It was all about tax cuts. I should say that it was events on the Sunday that destabilized the markets as much as events on the Friday in terms of apparently doubling down. Um, so I don't characterize it as choice. But I'm not sure if the lady who asked the question is still here about benefits. She's no, gone. But it's not benefits versus top rate coming down. I think there is a strong case naturally to get inflation under control, hence that debate on benefits would be addressed. But my personal view would be to increase benefits in line with inflation. As and that was an issue that was raised when Rishi Sunak gave his spring statement back in March as well. Can, can I just press you on that point that I asked, Gerard, about the 45p rate? Do you think this is, to what extent is this a matter of optics, where you can say, you know, it looks no, bad, I, and, or to what extent do you think it's a matter of economic... A case could be put, I'm not saying I would put it with look, any in, great in, confidence, in, that reducing top marginal rates of tax could even lead to revenue gains. Well, now, that uh, might, doesn't help it play well in the media, even if true. And no, I actually, in economic terms, the... Uh, as I touched on earlier, my view would have been that it should have been presented as part of a tax simplification plan overall. So I'm not against it. I thought it should be done alongside fiscal drag being addressed, marginal rates at £50,000 and £100,000 being addressed, and then you have lots of gainers. Right. Also, if I could say, because someone outside, lots of people have been saying about bankers' bonuses, for instance, reducing, addressing that is vitally important for the City of London's competitiveness. But again, that could have been packaged separate to this as part of the city. So I'm not against any of this. And it's not just how the narrative in terms of how they communicated it. It's because it was left dangling. It allowed people to focus on the fact these aren't fully costed. Got it. Got it. Andrew, what's your take to that, the, the question that the ladies walked out of the yes, back in disgust? Um, left, yeah. uh, but the... This, I mean, is it optics about the top rate of tax or, or is there an economic, you know, potentially a lack of economic case about it? But is there a danger? The Prime Minister this morning refused to confirm that benefits uh, for the poor would go up in line with inflation. Uh, how's the government supposed to explain its position as being one that can find two billion at the top end of the spectrum but is struggling to keep benefits at the bottom end of the spectrum at effectively zero because uh, putting them above inflation is no real terms increase? Yeah, yeah, true, Mark. So one of my favorite quotes on tax, the best way to grow tax revenues in the long term is to cut tax rates today. Yeah? 
President Kennedy. So you'd make a laugh of right, argument. Right. Absolutely. And, and if you look at the Coolidge government in the 20s, Reagan, Thatcher, even Bush, the amount of tax taken from the top grew in those periods when tax rates had been cut. Yeah, so I would make that. Huh. On, on the benefits point, I think the spectator is 5.3 million people who are not working, and we all boast about high labor product, um, uh, participation rates and low unemployment. They've, added, they've done their homework, added the number up, but you only see it covered there, right? It's not an official SAT. 5.3 million people on working age benefits, not part of the labor force. And anybody in this room who's tried hiring skills recently knows just how damned hard it's been for years. Right? We need those 5.3 million mm -hmm. people back in the workforce. In fact, that's a very important point. The number of people who are not in the labour force, who compared to pre-pandemic, is about five to 600,000. A lot of people say it's about Brexit, but if you actually look at the data, um, 5.4 million EU nationals now have settlement status in the UK. Number of part-time visas given out is 30,000 as opposed to 2,500 three years ago. These are temporary workers. Do you think that some of that, Gerard, was uh, the COVID process might have just accelerated, yeah, say, yeah. early retirement, right? I'm thinking of Quinma. Well, it, you're so right. You've got it, a it kind is. of bump in, in people exiting the workforce. They would have done it at some point in the next four years, but given the pandemic and lockdown it, it, was it, on, they brought it forward. So. I, also, it's 18 to 24-year-olds, but yeah, primarily okay. it is over 50-year-olds, but they're a different age group. And it is a Western Europe problem, actually. We tend to look at these things in isolation. For instance, if you read the papers last week or the BBC, you wouldn't realise the Chinese into uh, the currency went to its weakest level since it was allowed to float. The Bank of Japan has intervened to stop the yen weakening so much. Yep. The headlines in India every day are about the weakness of the rupee and likewise on interest rates across the globe. And the same debate on um, workforce across yep. Western Europe, people because of COVID leaving yep. the labour force. Paul, what's your take on this uh, tax cuts at the top, benefits not protected conundrum? And do you think it's a matter of politics or do you think it's a matter of economics or a bit of each? Yeah, I think it's politics. I think, like it or not, it's all about the optics. And um, I think you know, benefits will have to go up with, with inflation. I think well, otherwise you won't have the time to put the plan in place. And I think one thing from a sort of a weary business perspective, you'd look, we've got plan fatigue, haven't we? And it's going to have so many plans what we need is delivery we need them to be executed on otherwise it's just theoretical debate and obviously we know there's a an election at best coming in in two years time but but events can very rapidly overtake and what we don't want is um a shorter period of time more plans and from a business point of view you've got to go out there you've got to earn some money you've got to go and pay your wages every single day so we need that clarity so we can get delivery, we can get plans executed, and we can start actually growing the economy and not just talking about it. Right, let me bring in uh, one more round of questions. Gentleman there with his hand up, sort of third row from the back. Then I'll come to the gentleman with glasses here, and then the gentleman at the back. Again, if you could introduce yourself, please, sir. Hello. Oh, yeah, my name's Lawrence. Um, I think that IR35 changes were excellent, and I think they're going to have a big, powerful effect. But my question is, why have we waited so long for Big Bang 2? Why have we waited so long for Big Bang 2? Two. Two. Okay. Sir. Thanks. It's uh, Nick from Eastern Walton constituency. Um, Gerald's already mentioned this, but does the rest of the panel agree that the marginal rate at 100k needs to be considered in any tax simplification review, particularly for students, if they're lucky enough, they have a marginal rate of 70%? Uh, what, oh, because of the student loan payback. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the gentleman right at the back there, you've got a microphone, sir. Thank you very much, yes. P.D. Udale from uh, Responsible Finance. Um, one of the last great efforts to reform um, the Treasury and an attack on Treasury orthodoxy was, was uh, the Macmillan Report in 1931, which basically said the banks aren't doing enough to support small businesses and lending. Do you think this government is, is doing enough to encourage the banks? It's given them a nice big... Um, handout, but it hasn't really done that much to encourage them to get back into small business lending. Right, well, let me go. This will be, I think, the last round of questions, and our panel can be very quick. Paul, let me start with you. Let me refresh your mind about those questions. Lawrence welcomed the uh, IR35 change, but he asked, where, why are we waiting for Big Bang 2, which I take to mean a, a revolution in financial services regulation, which may be coming. I can't ask the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, Nick asked about some of the appalling marginal pinch points on tax, because uh, for the, those relatively small number of people who earn £100,000 a year or more, you face typically a 62% per cent 
marginal rate because you start losing the threshold. And I hadn't done the extra, extra calculation of those who are paying back a student loan. And if you're in that position, it's barely not worth really trying to earn any more. Uh, what you might argue is quite an important entrepreneurial point in the, in the spectrum, right? These are probably the people you want to be striving to earn two or three times yeah, that amount. Yeah. And maybe they don't get through that. And then what about the banks? And, you know, are they lending to small businesses or not? Is there anything to be done there? That's a refresher on them. I'll take Paul, Gerard, and then Andrew, final comments I'll, from I'll you. try to be snappy because I know we're, we're running out of time. I mean, um, sequels. I went and saw Top Gun 2 this summer and sometimes great sequels can take a while can't they to come out so uh, that's about the best I got on that I mean Nick's point very very technical I, I really defer to Gerald on that but I, I think your point Mark that absolutely it's all about you've got to incentivize people to get off the couch go to work earn money because that's ultimately coming back into uh, HMRC which is going to be sort of building our schools and hospitals and and funding our military so uh, the, the technical aspects uh, I'm not qualified to really answer, but I think the thrust of the point I would agree with. And um, the government and you know, sort of they pushing banks to help businesses enough. Um, I suppose we would take the entire T of this Parliament rather than just this government in a, in a few weeks. I'd say no. Uh, I think businesses. You, know, you see the amount of of new startup banks that are popping up. I think that's a bit of a comment on the market and maybe what the traditional banks haven't been doing in that space. So I think that maybe. Um, there's some lessons to be learned there, but we do need more because businesses are suffering, they're squealing, and they need the support from the banks to be real rather than just rhetoric at this time. Gerard. Yeah, um, let me take the first and third question because I explicitly answered the second. Yeah, on the city, um, yeah, um, there was benign neglect shown towards the city after 2016. Um, too much of focus on the equivalence that was a nice to have, not unnecessary. Um, we have the ability to build a bespoke regulatory environment for the UK that will make the UK very competitive. The U London is losing out in competitiveness significantly to New York, in my personal opinion. There have been lots of good reviews. Austin Hill, in particular, if you have a chance to read them, they talked about how things work in theory but not in practice. I'm on the board of two firms in the city as well as working for a firm in the city. Um, what I would say without giving any secrets away for those two boards is that you, we encounter politically motivated regulators on the continent who are doing things that should not be allowed to be done. Reverse solicitation might sound like an um, unexciting thing to mention, but if you're a European client, you're allowed under reverse solicitation to ring up a firm in London and ask for them to do whatever you want. You're the customer. That is legal. It's legitimate. That most firms in the city are no longer doing that whereas they were prepared to do it before because the French regulators in particular said, we don't want you to do it. Uh, I would argue that there's been a lack of personal support, in my personal opinion, from uh, the powers that be in the city uh, on this issue. Um, in terms of the last question, Macmillan Gap, I love talking about the Macmillan Gap. 1931, the fact um, the Macmillan Gap sounds an esoteric topic, but in 2019, the Bank of England um, had... Um, a future of finance report written for it and in reply to it the Bank of England in its reply said that the current financing gap between small firms needs and what was provided to them was a mammoth 22 billion pounds they didn't use the word mammoth what I found shocking at the time was that they could make that comment without one senior person at the bank thinking it was an important enough issue to comment on and the media didn't pick them up on it so the gap is huge and the gap between what small firms need and what banks and finance provides is huge. But the minister's gone. There were a few good things in terms of entrepreneurs in the mini statement, whatever you want to call it, but lots more that can be done there. So can I just come back to you on the, the marginal tax point? Uh, yeah. Right. Do, do you think there are some points in the income spectrum where yeah, we've got yeah. this badly wrong? I mean, I mentioned the, the 100K pinch point. Obviously, that doesn't affect that large number of people, but I'm told it's quite common for a company director to be on in the 90s, and you might then say you've got a big disincentive. There are obviously terrible pinch points at the bottom on welfare withdrawal where you effectively face colossal marginal tax rates. Is this a fundamental weakness in the system, or is it inevitable in any kind of tax and welfare system that you get those bumps in the road, as it were? Yeah, uh, well... Uh, there's a person standing at the back of the room who's an expert on all of this. But, but, so, uh, but I think that there um, are changes that n are needed. Um, when Lawson, um, gosh, I'm not sure which year it was, uh, when he lowered marginal 
the rates of tax, 86, 86 or so, it was about tax simplification. We've had things become too complicated since. So yeah, at the bottom end of the spectrum, and um, Andrew touched on this before, effectively the working poor is a big issue. Mm. But yeah, there are pinch points when you, student loans, I see this from my own children, it's just ridiculous, and linked to RPI as well, crazy. Mm. And then above 50,000 as well and above 100,000. But um, you can't change this all overnight. But again, coming back to the economics of that top rate of tax, in economic terms, it's minimal. I've echoed the point before, or repeat, sorry, I don't want to repeat the point again. But tax implication can be done across the spectrum, not just at the top end. Andrew, final thoughts with you. Just to remind you of the questions. Is it time for another big bang in financial services? I'm not totally sure whether the last one was wholly deregulatory, by the way. Some of it brought in state regulation, where it was previously market oriented regulation. What about these marginal tax rates, pinch points? Uh, Nick asked particularly about 100,000 and up, but there's other points in the income ladder which are bizarre as well, especially moving off benefits into work. And banks and small businesses are the former doing enough to help the latter. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. And we're close to time, so I'll be brief. On, on deregulation, and, and um, let me mention one to a lot of people. But why is this not gone yet? It begins with G, G, GDPR. What on earth is going on, right? I'm sure lots of us in business see the pain of that. Yesterday, I was at a trade show. Do you remember you used to put your email down if you wanted people to follow up? Then they said, oh, no, we'll scan you, right? Now they don't bother scanning because of... GDPR, they've got to throw it all away and compliance, all this nonsense, right? So that's got to go. I worry that the, the regulatory pressure around the city is like the boiling frogs, and the EU has been turning up the heat, turning up the heat, turning up the heat. The frogs become more lethargic, and they hate any frog that tries to climb out. And the rumours that, the, you know, if Starmer gets in, one of the first things he'll do is just look at what the EU's done and catch up and say that's good for trade, right? Oh dear, oh dear. So we do have to make some important changes because the status quo will be very important. And very briefly on, on banks lending, um, I, I would just want to mention a book that's been doing the rounds, Edward Chancellor, The Price of Time. I guess you're familiar with this one. The main thing I took away from that is this 12 years of negative real interest rates is a very damaging anomaly and we need to get back to positive real interest rates like you know, when a lot of us grew up and for hundreds of years. And that, I think, makes a big change to how those markets work. We are clear out of time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just a couple of advertisements. A reminder, if you'd like the full list of events here in Think Tank, there are some cards with a QR code on the back so you can download it. Uh, at 4.30 p.m., so in just half an hour's time, the next event in this tent is, is the UK a safe space for free speech? And we will try and conduct that one against the musical accompaniment. I'm sure they're all very much in favour of free speech outside. Pure matter of coincidence, not trying to drown any voices out of the debate at all, I'm sure they would say. Um, my thanks to the panel, Chris in his absence, Andrew, Gerard and Paul for in just one short hour mapping out a way to making Britain a more pro-enterprise economy. Please join me in thanking them in the usual way. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you for coming. See you at